All right, I am just getting set up right now. Moving a few things out of the way. Hello and welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Be More LLC. I'm Rashim, the Be More Catalyst to help you do more, serve more, and be more. Today we are going to be discussing fundraising alchemy with D with the Denise Reed <laughs> Kelly. Yes, honey. Um, and we're going to be talking about how to spend straw into gold. You know, a lot of times the non nonprofits, they have big visions and big goals and big and, you know, big desires. And they're not necessarily driven by the money, but you still need money to get that mission fulfilled. Right. You still have to pay the operational costs. You still have to pay programming costs and that sort of thing. So today we're going to focus a little bit on the money aspect of it. And before we get too deep into that, I want to chat with you a little bit about Denise. You know, I, I only bring people that I trust, that I've had a, a connection with and interact and interaction with. And I got to really get to know Denise Reed Kelly through a program which her and I were a part of. And we just kind of developed through that program. It's a, a year long process of kind of developing ourselves to sharpen our skills so that we could do more and serve more and be more for our communities and our audiences. And so we both went through that process. And one of the things that I realized and I know about her is that she's committed to investing in her so that she can invest more in you. And so that's one of the reasons that I wanted to have her on. And I wanted to share with everyone all of her fundraising jewels. And, you know, at here we love to talk about the be more, what's each person's be more movement. And the be, of course, is your being, who you are at your core, your more. What, what is it that drives you? What are you reaching for? What's the transformation? And the movement is the actions that you take that you're committed to, to closing the gap between where you are and where you want to be. So with all of that, without further ado... Miss Denise Reed Kelly, please tell us first, what is your Be More movement? Well, well I, I just want to say thank you so much for that introduction. <laughs> you made it sound so fabulous. But, um, you know, we're here to talk about fundraising, event management, and my Be More movement is events. Um, everything about events. I love events. But one of the things that I'm most passionate about is events that are for a cause and that help move and push our communities forward. I think it's crucial for um, people as nonprofit leaders to understand that the work that they do in the community is vital for, you know, just how our everyday lives. I know, you know, from your background, it's important that we have people out there on the streets and that takes money. It takes funds. It takes I mean, we're so busy and so focused on working and getting the work done, but it takes being engaged with people who are able to provide those funds for you to get the work done. And so my Be More movement is making sure that our nonprofit leaders have those tools in place to be able to go out and snatch that money up. <laughs> All right, honey. I know that's right. Um, so tell me what, or tell us really, what kind of got you started in the whole aspect of fundraising and events? Like what drew you to events? Um, it's, I actually was drawn to events when I was in high school. I won't even tell you how long ago that was because I don't want to necessarily share my age with the world. But um, I, right out of high school, I got an internship opportunity with an aerospace company, and one of their focuses was on giving back to the community and helping um, bring in minority engineers into the fold and getting them involved in space exploration engineering. And so I was one of those kids um, that they put money into scholarship money, as well as um, just kind of outreach efforts in the schools and grassroots in the community. And so when I began working for them, the first thing that I thought um, would be ideal was being able to expose those kids to upper management and leaders. And so the very first um, event that I did was actually a series of events. I did a speaker series for executives, um, CEOs and executive VPs. Um, to go out and speak to high school students, uh, minority students and underserved communities who were able to um, expose them so they could see the possibilities for themselves. Um, so that was actually my first event. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's actually, 
it's kind of funny um, thinking back on it is that I didn't look at events as being a career decision mm-hmm. because I was very much involved in um, the science and chemistry was kind of my my jam back then. <laughs> but uh, I I just I'm, I've always been engaged um, in nonprofits throughout my entire life, and I just think it's it's like I said, it's a footprint of our community, and I just really think it's necessary that we make a strong effort and push. And people love to do things. People love to be actively engaged and actually doing something. And everybody likes a good party, right? right. <laughs> so, <laughs> but we got a party with a purpose. You got right. a party with a purpose. You just get a party just for the sake of partying. And it's easy to get people's money when they're feeling happy. <laughs> right. This is true. That's true. So you told us a little bit about, you know, your background and kind of what got you up. Oh, I'm, I'm echoing a little bit. I probably, I'm going to probably grab some earphones um, when you start talking again. But you told us a little bit about how you got started and just kind of, it, it seemed like it's kind of happenstance, but it still it still seems like you kind of followed still your bliss and you, start, you, st- you still followed also a purpose. You know what I mean? Like you saw a need and you sought to, to kind of fill that need. And it, that's something that so resonates with uh, a lot of my clients in terms of being drawn by the purpose or the call or feeling the need and helping and supporting people. For a person who's, you know, they're doing nonprofit development and they are interested in, they, they want to do an event and they want to fundraise, what are some things that they need to start doing before they start doing a fundraiser? Like how can they pre-plan for something like that? That's a great question. And I think one of the things that fundraising leaders and um, nonprofit leaders in general need to think about is they need to think more so about the long game and not the short game. And Mm -hmm. so you should have a fundraising plan in place that you review yearly. Um, I personally like 18 months lead time um, in fundraising for anything when you're developing your plan and events are a sub part of, of that that whole overall fundraising picture. And so I think whenever you evaluating what kind of event you wanna bring into the fold, the best thing to do is to think about what types of events that you're able to participate and to pull off. Um, Look at your resources and then start evaluating what impact factors that you want to have, be it either donor engagement. You need to um, up base your volunteers. You need more, you know, engaged and active and hardworking volunteers. Are you looking to target high end corporate donors? Um, And so that's a long game. And. Yeah, you want to build your audience, and so it's, you you also have to think about serving your benefactors as well. And so a lot of times, it's events can be very simple as um, wanting to build more awareness for your cause in the community, and a small event can take place. You don't always have to think about we have to do this big, fabulous so gala. No, if you have a a walkathon, for instance, that you may want to do. Target target it out far enough in advance that you can actually build out a social media campaign. You have enough time to try to build awareness. Have many walks. You can do, like, uh, for instance, one of the biggest um, changes in fundraising was the ALS challenge, right? Mm. And that went viral. And that's something, and now it's what the uh, running man challenge was a challenge for people. All these little things that people like to do. And you can do them in such, um, it's all about building engagement. You can do them in such incremental moments, like creating, you know, build, you know, pledge a dollar for each time the video played or something very simple like that. And people can always do that, but definitely, I think the organization should look at the long game, not the short game, Mm -hmm. and always have opportunities for each touch point Mm -hmm. to be a giving point. And I I think that's huge. And so many people don't do that. Know your website, um, your social media profiles, anytime that you are speaking in the community, all of your um, promotional materials have giving points on yeah. each of those items. Absolutely. So 
First, I want to welcome Joy and Karen um, to the dialogue, to the conversation. If you have any questions, please do ask. I'm giving a little bit of feedback. But what I want to do um, while I have you here, I want to just encourage everyone who is listening live now and everyone who's also going to be listening later, go ahead and please grab a pen, a sheet of paper, some water, get covered. Listen, this paper was blank, like already she hasn't even started. And I'm trying, <laughs> what I'm trying to tell you is get the information. When you have the people in the place, get the information. Um, what, and, and so much of what you've said in terms of serving your benefactors, the high-end donors, because that speaks to having an awareness and an understanding of the type of people that you want to uh, attract and what that could look like. And I love the, the the information that you gave us in terms of planning, um, having an 18 month lead time, and the type of events. They could be small. They could be something like a a walkathon, um, and also planning the social media campaign. So what that speaks to me a little bit about, actually, Karen. I'm sorry, uh, Denise. I was just looking at Karen's name. Um, <laughs> is uh, it speaks to me about camp campaign like it speaks to me about uh hi there uh strategy and marketing and what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see people make in their planning stages of having an, an event like what are some key pieces that like you have to have this if you're going to plan a successful event um one of the biggest mistakes that people make is not having enough time mm. um that's that's the huge one. The other one is not actively engaging their board. Um, you know, board members have fiscal responsibilities to nonprofits to raise funds. And so whenever, you know, I tell people all the time, if you're looking for sponsorship, hit up your board, create a list of all the companies that you would like to engage with, your, you know, the dream list of people you would hope to give into, into your organization and assign each of those companies to a board member. Make the board member responsible and build out an accountability plan to build the relationship because they can build a relationship over time. Your board members should be connected in some way to you know, corporations, organizations that you wanna do um, when you wanna build up sponsorship for, for anything. And even just you know, long-term donors. Uh, another piece that people miss is reaching out to the people that they give to, and I'm not talking about benefactors, but I'm talking about vendors and suppliers that you use to actually, um, to perform whatever your programs and duties are as an organization. Tap into those people as well, because you can turn around if you spend, say you spend $20,000 with the same vendor every year, you can always go back to them. You have a relationship with them and say, you know, hey, we, we've, we give you $20,000 in revenue a year. We're hosting this event. We would love for you if you could do in-kind donorship, you know, for this, or you could be a sponsor of this. And they're almost always willing because you are a repeat customer. And so I think we have to always look at those pieces as well. Um, another big mistake that I see people making is confused messaging. Mm. Um Think about the messaging that you want to get across in the community. Um, that whatever your mission is for your organization, you should always be speaking to your mission. Your event should not be completely unaligned <laughs> with that. You don't want to, if you're a grassroots organization and you're focused on, you know, let's say education in the community for elementary school students. You don't want to have this big, fabulous, multi, you know, hundreds of thousand dollar gala that does not in any way incorporate a message of education. Mm -hmm. Like that would be a big miss. Right. And I think, um, you know, people, we get caught up in thinking that the event has to be so expensive and it doesn't. It needs, it just needs to be engaged. Mm. I love what you said about that because so much of this really speaks to so much of the pre-work 
in terms of what your organization, like how your organization is aligned, having clarity on that, having clarity on your target donor, your branding, your messaging, all of that is just like really ties into everything that you're saying right now. And it's just going to make you more successful as a fundraiser. And, you know, it's interesting because when you said the confused messaging, um, and the whole aspect of alignment, I was thinking of there was actually an event that I went to and it was something like save the save some type of animal. And I thought it was going to be super vegetarian, but it wasn't super vegetarian. It was like the, you know, the reddest, juiciest meat. <laughs> I was just like thinking like, I think that not, you know, they should have had um, just taking more consideration of that. Like if they want, if they would have had a conversation with you, you probably would have been like, let's at least have some vegetarian options, not just you know a small sal salad on the side. But somehow there was a disconnect between the organizational mission and then the person who planned the event. And I'm wondering if they even communicated. Right. And you see that a lot. Um, you know, I can imagine for what you said, an example, you know, not only should they have more vegetarian options, hopefully it was a sustainable and an environmental friendly <laughs> event, because if your mission is an environmental mission, you need to make sure you have an environmental event. All of your events should be that way. And that's, I think, like you said, people they miss the ball when it comes to marketing and maintaining a consistent message because just like in the regular in the marketplace confused buyers don't make decisions confused donors don't give you money <laughs> it's a very simple concept and so i think people have to really focus and hone in what exactly they want to say and who they who they're saying it to i think that's also um, that's also key because like you, you went to that particular event and you were confused, but what about the organizations that they support who are a benefit of that? How is that received? You know, you also have to look at that. And so benefactors don't want to feel betrayed either. And I think we have to really um, take a hard look at our events end to end and map out the experience, you know, at each touch point throughout the process. Yeah, yeah. I see Karen made a comment. Confused donors don't open the open their wallets, just like you mentioned, just like you said. And I think that is a very, very good point and something that people need to take in, take into consideration. Like, if I'm confused about what you're up to, like I'm not, you know, I don't, I'm not going to make a transaction with you. I'm not going to separate from my money for you if if I feel like I'm not clear on what you do, or even worse, if I feel like you're not clear. <laughs> right, because <laughs> you don't think your money is going to be used properly. Right, right. Don't throw money away. <laughs> and I also appreciate what you said about in terms of the event doesn't have to be some big grandiose scale up. Because in a lot of cases, or in some cases, people reflect on that, like, oh, you have all this money to spend on this fancy gala, then you don't need my money. Or is my money going to pay for right. you know, this open bar over here? You know what I mean? So those are some things that um, are, you know, outside of, I think, the normal purview or like the normal line of thinking as it relates to um, uh, when you when you decide to fundraise. So tell us more. What are some key concepts that no matter what, um, when we leave here today, you want to make sure that we get these three to five things out of this? Um, one, definitely evaluate your event options. Um, I think that's huge when you start thinking about the different types of events you want to host. And then two, know your numbers, know your budget, know what you have to work with and think outline. If you make a spreadsheet and outline all of your expenses or potential expenses, how much of that can be written off easily? And by written off easily, I mean, who can you get to underwrite some of those expenses? If you can reach your break, I think this is my philosophy. If you can reach your break even within three to six months of the actual event itself, the event is worthwhile continuing. Because, and especially if you have another six months of lead time to actually do additional fundraising, it'll be a successful event. But as long as, if you can't hit break even um, within three to six months, then I would say reevaluate why you're doing the event. There are some events that are okay to take small losses on. And those are events that you really, really, really are reaching 
far out long game to impact a particular donor base mm. um, that could pay off for you big in the future. But take small losses, not huge gambles. <laughs> um, you don't want to take huge gambles um, with your nonprofit organization. I just because you won't be able to impact the community as much. Right. Well, one of the one of the things I know, and I love what you say, it evaluates your event options, um, know your numbers, your expenses, and um, in terms of also your write off. Also, the events have a lot of moving pieces, and and I've never like planned like any like super big event really, but just like planning or getting a little pieces around my wedding. It's like, geez, I got to think about this. And then I got to think about that. And there's so many moving pieces. What are the main pieces that typically come up in a, um event that people are planning for fundraising that they need to keep their eye open for? Um, you need to keep your eyes. One, you want to build a great team. Um, that's another piece that I want to say um, that's very, very important. And you want to build um, particular types of teams. You need volunteers um, who are going to be responsible for not just executing on the day of, but who can do some of the work. Um, you definitely want a sponsorship team. You need, a, I hate to call it a sales team because it's really a fundraising team, but if you're selling tickets or entrance fees to the event, you need a team that's actually really good and well-connected at, um, at making those sales because you need someone who's not afraid to open their mouth and get you know, and get that money going. Um, you want someone, if you can get an event planner, you should get an event planner. I know not every nonprofit um, has the funds to go out and hire a professional event planner, but someone like me who works with nonprofits, I'll always um, give nonprofits a significant discount and also assist them in the fundraising process to help kind of make up some of that gap. Um, if you can get a planner, um, definitely you want to look into end-to-end -end experience. Um, you'll need a PR and marketing um, effort. You'll need an awareness effort um, and awareness in your benefactors. And you'll also need, you know, if it's an event with food, you want to look at catering, um, any type of marketing materials, paper, things like that. And definitely someone who can develop a logistical timeline for you. This and is project good. Manager. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is good. And one of the reasons why I feel like this is so good is because you brought up some things that people don't typically think of in the nonprofit arena, right? Sales team. People don't think of like, it's like, no, we're a nonprofit. We don't sell. No, you have to sell tickets to this event. Right. Yes. And um, I've been in situations where there have been some people who, who were selling tickets, who they just weren't the right person to sell the ticket. You know, they were kind of just like, oh, if you want to go, if you're not, you know, you don't have to type of thing. And that's something that, to take into consideration when you made the comment about someone who doesn't have a problem opening their mouth, somebody who's going to gonna share the vision and mission of the organization and kind of really sell it. And those aren't things that we typically think of when we think of nonprofit. The other thing that you brought up uh, really is kind of like marketing. Like you need to get somebody on top of marketing. It's not if you have the event and announce it, they will come. No, you have to no. have marketing. And then you also mention a project manager, which I think is excellent because if you were the ED, you don't want to be stressed out. <laughs> or, no, you don't. And you need an event chair. You need an event chair who's going to be responsible for pushing all that forward. And with a fundraising event in particular, I think it's very important to make sure that somebody is watching the numbers as you go along. Um, and definitely keeping everybody accountable for the job that they had said that they would fulfill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the thing about I feel love, like in terms of like project managers is they they know all the all the moving parts so that I don't have to. You know what I mean? I don't I don't necessarily know the, the number to the vendor, but that's not what I want to be thinking about on game day, right? <laughs> <I don't want laughs> about this vendor isn't here why isn't this set up correctly no a project manager that understands all those moving parts 
really good. And another thing that I kind of picked up on what you said is um, it's kind of like an outreach team because like to get the word out, so to speak, that this is coming up. And I think they would probably work hand in hand with the marketing team. And you also talked about people having people who are well connected. So it's, it takes a lot more consideration and thinking in terms of building a team. You're not just collecting bodies. You're not just collecting momentum or your cousin, <laughs> your BFF. You're collecting people who are connected, people who can sell, people who know marketing, people who have, you know, all of these different parts. And I think that, you know, it's, it's simple and easy to say, but I think that that's something that really should sink d- deeply. So if you are listening right now, I think that that's something when, you, when you're thinking about the event, we always think about where is it going to be? What day is it going to be? What food? <laughs> think about how we're going to get these tickets sold. Who's going to tell the tickets? Who's going to do the marketing? What is that marketing going to look like? Who's going to do the outreach? Are we going to have an event planner? Are we going to have a project manager? You know, all of those things are very important. Oh, gosh, this is such, such good stuff. You see my page. Look. <laughs> you got your notes. I like that. My page is like lit, but I still have room for um, a little bit more. Um, you know some of the mistakes, um, and I picked up on three of the like biggest mistakes, and one of them is not preparing enough time. Um not actively engaging your board. I think that's a good one too, because a lot of times when you're new and an emerging nonprofit, your board isn't, you, you don't always make the best decisions with our first board. Our first board are usually people that we know they're not necessarily well connected, but they'll you know ride with us through the bylaws and the, and the first establishment of it. So in, actively engaging, engaging with your board also means like holding them accountable. Mm-hmm. This is kind of part of your role as a board member. Um, And I also like what you said about in terms of creating a list. Yes. Yes. Um, Because what it made me think of, too, is sponsorship. You know, businesses who will contribute and eliminate a line item, which kind of moves into, for me, knowing your numbers. Can XYZ business, can Walmart remove a line item for me? You know? Um, but in order for them to, for me to even think Walmart too, I have to know my numbers. I have to know how much each thing is going to cost. So when I go to Walmart, I'm not like, you know, could you help us out? We have this event. Right, like, right. You know, I say, I could say, we're putting on this event. This is what we have. Um, and this is how you can contribute, you know? Right. And when you're building sponsorship, um, not only do you want to know the numbers from that perspective, because you want to go to a Walmart and say, we're having this event, we need $4,000 in order to do X, Y, Z. And from that $4,000, it will benefit, you know, this program, which is beneficial to you, Walmart, because it helps give you a better name in the community and among this demographic. You see, you have to be that specific to the sponsor because it's always a what's in it for me, right? They want to know what's in it for them. And they either have to want to participate in the cause because they're passionate about it. Um, They have to know someone who's passionate about it, whom they trust, which is where your board comes in and making sure that people in the board are actively engaged in seeking sponsorship. Uh Oh, looks like she froze for a second. She was just um, Denise Kelly just giving us some really good tips on sponsorship and different ways that we need to go about sponsorship um, and all of the great benefits of like, how, how do we do that? Like, how do we do sponsorship? How does that show up? One of the key things, of course, is knowing what's on your line item, knowing what your budget looks like, knowing what it is you need. And she also mentioned about the what's in it for me factor. That is so important. And one of the th- reasons that I'm so oh. glad that she brought that up, and I think that it's really so key, is because I don't think nonprofit organizations always know that they have something of value to contribute. We always think of our, you know, we tend to think of ourselves as we are, we are here, everyone else is there, and we need help and we need support. But the thing is about the the nonprofit, the nonprofit arena is we are pro- providing a public a public service that can make the world better, a public service that can help. It helps the community where where that store is located, the community where that school is located. So we're not just taking, 
we are actually providing a service and we add value, right? Another thing that when she was talking about the um, um, adding value and, and uh, what's in it for me, sometimes, especially if you're dealing with like high-end donors, they have, like if you have different sponsorship levels, okay, at this level, we will put your name on all of the flyers that we hand out. Or at this level, we will put your name on X, Y, Z. Why is that important? You may not think it's a big deal, but that's marketing for, for them. You are doing a service. You are providing a service and making an exchange for them. And if it's a big organization, um, you can ask, you know, how much do you typically spend on marketing? Well, my event has a uh, is estimated to have about 300 people. So I can, you know, put your name on XYZ flyer that we're passing out. That's going to be on every single paper so that your information could be on in front of 300 people people. And I love that because it gives us a new way to think about us as nonprofits, that when we're fundraising, we're not just going and saying, hey, can I get, can I have, but we're saying, can I make an exchange with you? For the way, you know, the way that we impact the world, the, that we impact the community, can we make an exchange? Can you support us in this? And I think another aspect of that that is really important in terms of sponsorships and partnerships is finding those businesses, those organizations, those for-profit or non-profit organizations who are in, in some ways aligned with what you do. They may still do it for, for a fee, right? So you may do a service where you're doing this service um, for youth. And if the service that you do for youth, think about the stakeholders involved in youth, in youth development. So some of the stakeholders that are involved with youth development, there are teachers, there are principals, there are mothers, there are um, tutoring agencies. Uh, what else serves kids? There are people who sell backpacks. All of those things and in all of those ways, those are another set of stakeholders. And with those stakeholders, they care about who you're serving. So what you're really going to them to do, going to them and asking them is, can we partner to make a difference? Right. If it's Kmart, you sell book bags. Can we partner to make a difference in the community? Can we partner to make a difference? Or I see that your organizational mission or your organizational goal is X, Y, Z. How can I support you? And being clear on how you can um, support them. So if you're clear on how you can support them, you know a little bit of some, you know a little bit of something about their organization, right? And I love that um, Denise Reed Kelly brought that up in terms of talking to the organizations about uh, what's in it for them, uh, whether that is you are making a direct barter exchange. Or if you're just saying, I'm going to promote and let everyone know how fantastic you are. Organizations love that. They love to be able to say, we serve X amount of people. So if you can make that message plain and simple for them and say, we're giving out 75 book bags so that children can go to school ready and prepared and have a great first week. And especially if you could attach that to the statistics, we found that 70% of students who go to school prepared on the first day have a better chance of completing successfully or do or do better will you join us in making a difference right you have given them something very clear very concise and you you have tell, told them exactly what you, what you want and it also speaks to the fact that you are aware of what they're up to and what they do have to offer and gratefully uh denise reed kelly is back with us so i'm gonna just let you go ahead and take off from where you left off. Yeah, sorry about that. No worries, technology. Yes, the gremlins. I love the little <laughs> But um, I can just say, can you hear me okay? Because I'm hearing it. Now. I can. I can hear you okay. I see. And so um, basically what I was saying is the board's responsibility for engagement and how you would go to a particular sponsor, um, being very specific about the amount of money that you need, letting them know how it's going to impact, what it's going to cover for the event. Also, what is it going to do for them by participating in your event? And so you want to give them the what's in it for me aspect of it because they need to be able to feel connected. Um, and that's where your board comes in. You know, people give money to people 
people they know, love, and trust. And your board has to have some sort of fiscal responsibility. One particular resource that, you know, I know when people are building boards, you mentioned, we don't always do it the right way. We often ask our friends and family because those are the people that we know, um, but they're not always the right people to be on a board. And so board source is a great resource. Um, I think if you take some time to invest in some of the resources that they have about fiscal responsibility for boards and buy those books for the people who are on your board or, you know, give them just kind of an outline of what it is you need to do. I think you'll, it'll be a really good stepping stone for them to truly understand the fundraising efforts that they need to participate in to move the board, to move your nonprofit forward. Yes, awesome. I mean, you've already given us so many really, really great juicy nuggets and so much really great content. Before I ask my um, a few more questions, Karen actually posed a question in the chat section and she says, we do tricky trades at our events, always trying to up level this for our event. Any creative ideas on things to include? You said tricky trades? Tricky trays. So can you expound on that a little bit more, Karen? While Karen is expounding a little bit more on tricky trays and um, if, if they can possibly use that to up level their event, I'd like to know what are some of your favorite resources that you like to use? Can you share with us some links, some sites, some books or something that we can go and check out that will really help us so that maybe one day we could be as good as Denise Reed Kelly? <laughs> In our event planning, <laughs> uh, yeah, Board Source is one of my go tos. Even if you don't subscribe um, to their paid service, they have a paid service for nonprofits, but just subscribe to their free blog because it will definitely um, keep you up to date with the trends and you can see what some of the bigger nonprofits are doing from an event perspective. And you can kind of utilize that in your what you're doing and how you plan out for the year. Also, um, a big resource that I like is Mobile for Good. Um, mm. in the website, there's also a book, um, and it's centered around how to engage the mobile movement to do good. And it's a huge one. Um, it helps you build out your social media strategy um, from a giving perspective. And I think that's something that we need to understand and tap into. Um, another one that I like is something called One Today. It's a mobile app. Um, I, th I think every nonprofit should register for one today if they could, because- O-N-E today? Yes, O-N-E today. Um, it's an app, I think it's by Google, but um, basically what the app is, you can go in and create my little micro campaigns. And once you create a campaign, once you, you give a dollar to your own campaign and it goes social. So then all of your friends will know, hey, whoever's looking for any particular type of um, cause, they can also give a dollar. And it's just, it's residual money almost, <laughs> so to speak. And it just go, it can continue to go and go and get viral. Um, and it adds up and people can choose to give regularly. They can choose to give one time. Uh, but it just definitely, it helps you not only with awareness, um, because more people will get to know you and find out about you, but also, you know, it definitely will help at least give you some funds that will help. Um, increase Fantastic. That. Three great resources, boardsource.org. And then was it, it looks like it says, say it again. Mobile for good. Mobile for good. Right. Um, and then there's one today, and I put those links in the chat section. Um, so Karen expounded a little bit. So she said the way that tricky trays work is that you buy tickets, and then you put your tickets in the container that represents the prize, gift baskets, cart tickets. Is this like a raffle, Karen? Tricky trays. Okay, so a raffle. So what she wants to know is if you're thinking about a raffle, uh, what are some creative ideas on things to include in the raffle? Um, or whatever you, my whenever someone does a raffle, it's almost to me like an auction, so to speak, but not but just minus the bidding, right? And so yeah. I I feel like the prizes should be something that people 
who are in your target actually want. So it's kind of yeah. hard to say these are the things you should give away because I don't know your particular target um, for your donor base. But you want it, you want it to not only be uh, an attractive gift and something of you know value. Hopefully, you can get it donated. Um, but it just all depends. Like for example, you can give away hypothetical if you had an autographed iPad from Steve Jobs or something hypothetical that's in a big dream right um, but your donor base was people who were actively involved in technology and your nonprofit was based you know the nonprofit mission was to increase the technological footprint um, in diverse and underserved communities right that would be a good raffle gift but it's yeah. No, it has the a lot. It all aligns with your mission, but it's also something that people want and are interested. Mm -hmm. um, and definitely look for look for things that people can donate to. <laughs> no, no, that's a good answer because you do have to know who it is that, and and also your gift has to align mm -hmm. with the with the organization. Sometimes that has to align, or if it, at least it doesn't necessarily have to be doggy treats at a dog at a at a pet nonprofit, or if you have a cat with uh, cancer, doesn't necessarily have to be cat treats, but um, it could be so just make sure that it's not out of the realm of what is something that would align with it. So you wouldn't have um, anything that is anti-cats. Right. That's you would, and you will hopefully have a donor avatar of some sort. So you know the types of things that they like. You know, it's so interesting. Uh, right. No fur coats. That's right, Karen. <laughs> no fur coats. Um, it's so interesting. And, and one of the things that I tell people in, in the nonprofit arena and how one of the different nuances that in terms of like for profit, nonprofit and how revenue is generated and how, you know, that, that whole thing in businesses, we typically have one avatar. Right. Because we have a target market. However, in the nonprofit arena, you have several avatars for different things. You have your high-end donors, benefactors. You have the target market that you're serving, right? You have the type of person that you want on your team. So it is a lot to think about and you have to think about it like it's a cake. It's not like a plum. Like a business is a plum. It's one thing, right? But with a, with a cake, it's like, in order for this cake to work, I'm going to need sugar, right? I'm going to need sugar and some milk and some eggs and some this and some that. And that's going to make the cake. I just can't show up with flour. It's just not going to work. One of the things that I want to ask you, um, give us one of your final thoughts to make sure that we take away and, and drill into our head and or something that we can do today or tomorrow or within the next 30 days if we're thinking about like what should we start working on and I also want to know let us know where can we reach you where can we connect with you where can we get more information if we want you to do our events okay um well first I'll tell you one thing that you can do today is take a look at all of your touch points for your donors um, look at your website, look at your social media profiles. And if you don't already have one, add a link to donate. That's step one. <laughs> um, step two, start to look at your existing resources that you have um, at your organization from a team perspective and look at your teams and see if you have all the skill sets necessary to pull off an event. Um, are you connected to them? Reach out. Think volunteers, think board members, think existing staff, um, and think very passionate donors who you can convert into a volunteer. Um, look at some of those people, um, do a quick analysis. And then always, if you don't already know your numbers, go, go look at your numbers. Know, your, know what your organization could actually pull off financially and what you couldn't. Um, so those are the things I think you should do right away. Um, if you're looking for me, one thing in particular, I did create a free resource for everybody um, that <laughs> outlines a lot of these steps if you did not um, take copious notes like Rasheed did. Um, I'm going to still take advantage of the free gift. So tell us where we can find it. It's at fundraising event. 
fundraisingeventsuccess.com. That's fundraisingeventsuccess.com. Um, and my information and how to reach me is included in the gift as well. So you can reach out via email. There's a Facebook group you can join if you want to just link up and ask questions. I'm actively in there and happy to answer any questions anyone has and would love to just hear about what everyone is doing. Um, I love to hear about everyone's causes. Um, my own personal causes are always centered around education and kids. I, I love kids. Um, so I'm all about pushing the footprint because I think education and exposure is the key to success in many different ways. And we have to let our youth see themselves in others um, in order to know their vision and their dreams. But that's a sidebar, but <laughs> fundraising <laughs> event success.com. So thank you again so much for sharing so much of your content, giving us something to walk away with, giving us a free gift that we can put in our hand. I'm going to go check it out and get the five. Is it five fundraising strategies? Five? Yep, five five steps steps. fundraising event success. Everybody needs to have that. Like um, I'm, what I'm going to try to do is also see if I can get that link and put it on my site as well. Um, if you feel like writing me up just like a little blurb about you and then a little blurb, a few lines about that, I'm going to make sure that I put that on the site because I want everybody to be able to get access to that information. Um, thank you again for your time. Thank you for everyone who joined us live. Thank you for the great questions, Karen. Everyone who's watching this on the replay, thank you so much for joining and checking this out. Um, if you want to take a deeper dive and go further, please do check out bemorellc.com forward slash real live is actually a four week training that is coming up. Um, July 10th is the day that it starts and it's four weeks intensive It's not open to the public and I have limited seatings. Do not be mad at me. I'm letting you know ahead of time that I have limited seatings. Don't come from a neck people. All right. Um, thank you again. Until next time, continue to do more, serve more and be more. Thank you, Rasheen, for having me. Yeah.